Greetings and salutations gamers, my name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Weekend, and welcome back to the Dark Souls Challenge. Last time we completed Dark Souls Without Walking, a headache of a challenge that was tricky to map out but came together to form a beast of a run. But today, we're moving on to something special, and to fully understand today's run, we've gotta go back. Ten and a half years back, all the way to December 21st, 2012. Back in the days of classic Dark Souls, a user known as Vegeta311 would begin a new type of challenge, the low level one shot. The rules were interesting and simple. In order to level up, you have to spend points. In order to earn points, you have to one shot a boss or mini boss. A boss was worth two points, a mini boss was worth one. And finally, if you cannot clear a boss in less than two hits, the challenge is over. At the time I was 13 years old, and the idea of the challenge fascinated me. I considered myself to be decent, but to be one-shotting bosses while at a low level? That seemed... insane. But people back then rose up to tackle it, and all to varying degrees of success. After enough time, the two-shot rule faded, and people began to chase after a purely one-shot playthrough. But as far as I or anybody else I know could tell, nobody ever did it. There were multiple roadblocks, but even the best of players were stumped by the Four Kings. And with enough time, the challenge faded back into the archives of YouTube. Ten and a half years passed, and we reached 2023. Dark Souls challenges are at their prime, and several new creators, including myself, are now tackling the game in new and interesting ways. That's when a good YouTube friend of mine reached out to me about a new group challenge. The Backlogs, also known as Lemon, wanted to get together for a whole new competition between us challenge runners. And the challenge? To complete a Dark Souls low-level one-shot playthrough. To be honest, I'm not sure if the old days of Dark Souls low-level one-shot inspired Lemon's idea or not, but before I even saw the rules, I was already in. When I saw exactly what kind of run we were taking on, it was on. The rules for this challenge under Lemon's rule set are admittedly… complex given the way he phrased things. Me and several other runners spent a lot of time with Lemon in order to figure out exactly what the rules were, and after a while we finally settled on a rule set that was functional enough for us all to tackle the run. They are as follows. As of right now, the Asylum Demon is impossible to one-shot, so the challenge begins after the Asylum. Mini-bosses, NPCs, and bosses must be killed in one of two ways. Either the target dies without the player ever dealing damage to them, or the target dies within one button press. When this happens, we get a point, and every point can be used for a single level up. And finally, no glitches are allowed. The winner of Lemon's competition goes to whoever can get the farthest in the game without getting stuck, and any tiebreakers are settled by whoever gets the most points. And that's everything set. Lemon gave everybody the go, and it was time to take on the Dark Souls Remastered Low-Level One-Shot Challenge. I can almost guarantee that nearly everybody in this challenge is going to start Pyromancer, so I wanted to shake things up. We start off by picking the bandit for its starting strength and take the master key for the early game maneuverability. As we land in Lordran, I want to make a quick side note. I will be showing what I spend each point on, but not necessarily when I spend every point. As the game goes on, I tended to bank up on points, so I'll just let you know what every point went to as we earn it. To start off, I headed into the Undead Burg and baited the Black Knight to the edge of the barrel stairs. He'll easily die to one hit due to gravity and give us a point in dex. Point number two, we can use an outcropped ledge and dark root basin, which will make the halberd black knight go over the edge. We'll put that into strength. While we're down here, we can quickly grab the red tearstone ring for the first major piece to our setup. While we're at 20% or less HP with the ring on, our damage will increase by 50%. This is going to be a pretty big component for our build most of the run. Afterwards, the knight in the church sends himself flying over the edge for another strength level, and we make our way down the elevator for the Asylum Revisit. We can trade snugly some rubbish for a Titanite chunk we'll use later, and draw Oscar down to the Stray Demon's arena. Stray Demon is more than willing to take care of him for us, earning us another strength point, and we can do the same thing to one of the Black Knights. 
With 18 strength, we have more than enough strength to two-hand this Y-hander and immediately take it up to plus 5. It's not the weapon I'm after, but it'll definitely work for now. In the meantime, we head down to Blight Town and remind Mildred on how gravity works. Although in spite of us, even in death she somehow defied the law of physics. We've come down to Blight Town because I have a smacking stick strong enough to let me farm the Swamp Slugs. They have a chance to drop large Titanite Shards, but more importantly they can drop green Titanite Shards in stacks of 5. Usually they're not so rare, although today they were, uh, pretty stingy with drops. Eventually we get our hands on two batches of green Titanite and stop to grab the Smacking Stick Plus, better known as the Great Club, on the way out. Although, we're in need of another strength point before we can use it. So back in the parish, we lure the board to the stairs where we can Red Tearstone Ring Golden Pine Resin plus 5 Zweihander plunge attack him for the one shot. And this little piggy gives us just enough strength to wield the Smack Stick Plus. Before we can use it though, it's gonna need some juice. So we make our way down through the catacombs to Vamos the Blacksmith who takes it first up to standard plus 5 and then with our green titanite shards we'll ascend it and upgrade it to a fire great club plus 5. Essentially the elemental equivalent to a plus 10 weapon. We'll take the burning basher to the Taurus demon and with a red tearstone ring plunging attack we can easily take out the bull in a single attack. More than enough damage to kill it twice in one attack. Sunboy Solaire flew too close to the sun and became our first attunement level, and Capper Demon is next up on the list. This fight was a little annoying because I kept landing on his head while setting up, which would deal 2 damage to him, which meant I had to reset the fight more than a few times. But it wasn't too long before we found our run. Yet another Red Tearstone Ring Fire Great Club plus 5 plunging attack was enough to seal the deal. The Depths is a pretty big upgrade for us early on. Not only will it give us access to the Large Ember for better standard upgrades, but it will also give us access to Laurentius who will, in turn, unlock Pyromancy for us. Pyromancy is going to be extremely important for our build in a few ways, but before we begin to explore why, we killed the Church Channeler by pure accident in one attack. To be fair, he kinda deserves it. At this current point, we don't have enough damage to fully one-shot the Gargoyles, so we're going to have to upgrade again. Thankfully, we can head down to Blight Town and easily grab our next component to our build, Power Within. This spell slowly drains HP, but in return gives the player a boost to stamina regen and more importantly a 40% boost to our damage. That means if we're within red tearstone range with active power within, we have a bonus 90% damage. That is a massive increase, but keep in mind that we're at a fifth of our health with a spell that is actively draining it. This may turn on hyper mode but our timing in boss fights with this setup has to be fairly precise. That being said, it's more than enough to clear Gargoyle number 1, and Gargoyle number 2 is even less stressful. As a side note, I didn't realize that both Gargoyles counted as individual points until much later on in the run, so the second Gargoyle point will come back much later. Oswald of Kareem slowly watched us ease into hyper mode before being liquidated into another attunement level, and then we set our eyes on the next major boss, Quelag. The Lava Spider is going to be a massive issue, given her immunity to fire damage and extremely tanky health bar. She has 3139 health in total. That's more than the Iron Golem. Hell, that's even more than Sanctuary Guardian, a DLC boss. She's literally almost two and a half pinwheels. This isn't going to be easy. So let's get to work. The Great Club we can easily upgrade into a plus 10 with all the large Titanite we farmed from the Swamp Slugs, and now it's time to start making our way to the next upgrade tier through the very large Ember. New Londo Ruins I tried to clear like a normal human being, but the Ghost House is just a killjoy. So save and quit out next to the ladder with a bunch of armor and poise, reload and climb the ladder. Secret Technique Flaming Unga Bunga gives us Strength 21 from Inward as well as his key, so now we have access to drain new Londo. Once the very large ember is in our hands, it's time to start rounding up Titanite chunks. Most of them we can collect in the lower runes, and then after we parried Party Pooper for another strength point, we can get the jump on the Greatsword Black Knight for our last chunk and another bonking point. 
The Turbo Smack 9000 is now up to plus 14, and unless we somehow win the Titanite Slab Lottery, this is probably where it's going to stay for a decently long time. We're at about the damage cap we can realistically hit in a decent amount of time. At least, without farming for Dragon Scales, without a Gold Serpent's Ring until I lose my mind. I'm not even planning on going into the Ash Lake for this challenge though. I want to get this challenge done in 20 hours or so, so let's get this done more... efficiently. Looking beyond Quelag, we're going to need a lot of souls. So it's probably a good idea to grab the Silver Serpent's Ring now, as the soul drops start to get big enough to make it useful. That means we have to one-shot Pinwheel, which is easy enough. Laugh all you want. None of you will ever know what mask he dropped this time. I'm going to need gold pine resin for Quelag, so on my way down to buy some in the depths, we unsuture the butcher and mince the mouse for strength points 26 and 27. Any other gold pine resin we need beyond this point will have to farm from the mushroom people. So on the way down, we smack the titanite demon for point. Wait a second. I never wrote this one down. I actually never spent this point. Neat. Darkroot Knight takes a quick plunge into Oblivion for Unga Boonga 28, and we can farm up our gold pine resin off of the forest mushrooms. Afterwards, we can quickly stop by the Moonlight Butterfly. A nice bonk in hyper mode is easily enough to take care of her once she lands. Last stop before Quelag, Bullcut Bastard gets turned into a mashed strength point. The strategy for Quelag is actually pretty tricky. It's a weird balancing act of timing and RNG, something we'll see a lot of this run. We need to lure Quelag just beside the door where we have enough room to plunging attack just as our power within ticks us into hyper mode. But Quelag will almost always start the fight with an attack that's hard to work with. We need to try and bait attacks in a way that will properly lure Quelag into the correct spot and then plunging attack her. But even a normal plunging attack isn't enough. We have to also make sure that we tag her human body with the attack to get enough damage to finish her off. Hyper Mode Gold Pine Resin plus 14 Great Club Plunging Attack into the Human Sweet Spot. It's a lot of things that need to line up, but it's not too long before we clear one of the biggest walls in the game. Our Power Bonking build is strong, and it'll get even stronger as we continue on. But there are points in the run where we won't get enough juice out of raw strength to one-shot certain bosses. In the background, I've slowly been pumping points into our Pyromancy Flame, which will eventually be the main source of damage in our run. But now that we've gained access to Sen's Fortress, I'm just about ready to complete the build that will one-shot the rest of the game. After grabbing Strength 31 from the Parasitic Wall, we move into Sen's Fortress. We can drop down from the first ledge to cash in the first Titanite Demon, and give the second one a good whack for strength 32 and 33. While we wait for the boulder trap to break down the wall, we can smack down our first Mimic for the final strength point of the run at 34. The big ticket item we really wanted from Sens though was the Covetous Gold Serpent's Ring. We're going to do a bit of farming this run to round out our build, and to save on time I wanted to make sure those farming sessions were as short as possible. So the item discovery boost here will be a massive help. Our first visit on our farming shopping list will be the Depths, but before we get to work on that, we'll need to clear out the Channeler, Kirk, and the last Butcher for our first three points into Intelligence. The main goal while we're down here is to build up our Humanity Reserves. We want to get up to 30 for a very specific Covenant reward, but we'll go ahead and grab a few extra for the road. They're nice for any other item farming we may want to get done. The last thing we want from the sewers though is to visit the Gaping Dragon. We aren't here to kill him, just to claim the best melee weapon we'll be using for this challenge from his tail, the Dragon King's Great Axe. This thing is super underrated, but we'll show off why in just a moment. First, we have to actually pump this thing full of upgrades, and that means we need Dragon Scales. Although, they aren't too hard to farm with our setup. Power Within Great Club at plus 14 staggers the Drakes in one hit, and kills them in two. For most of the drakes, we can just two-shot them, and the final pile of drakes will lure to the ladder, and then plunging attack off to clear the group. With 10 active humanity and the covetous gold serpent's ring, they drop at a decent rate, about one or two per trip on average. With 10 dragon scales to our name, we can upgrade the Dragon King's Great Axe to a maxed out plus five. 
This thing is going to be a monster. The Dragon King's Great Axe has two parts of it that make it an absolute menace of a weapon. First of all, despite it being a non-standard weapon, the Dragon King's Great Axe can be buffed with resins and spells on top of its already immense base damage. But to add on top of that, the special attack of the weapon releases a large shockwave as it swings down. If the axe connects to a target as the shockwave releases, both the buffed axe and the shockwave will deal damage at the same time. This in combination with hyper mode is a crazy amount of damage and will let us one shot not only Havel the Rock, but the Dark Root Hydra with ease. The Hydra is another wall in the game that we wanted to clear as early as possible, because this pyromancy build we've been building up needs all the juice it can get, and after freeing Dusk we can get a hold of her Dusk Crown for another 20% damage to spells. On our way to free Griggs, we encounter the undead bird merchant, and he encountered the Dragon King's Great Axe. He'll eventually become intelligence level 15. The last bonus we'll need is to grab the Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring from Griggs of Vinheim, which boosts both pyromancies and sorceries by another 20%. With that, the last piece we'll need to make some real progress is to finish upgrading our pyromancy flame to a plus 5 ascended flame. We need a lot of souls to do this, but nothing a big stick in the forest can't handle. The Forest Hunters drop a pretty good amount of souls, especially with the Covetous Silver Serpent's Ring on. It takes roughly about 40 minutes of farming, but after enough time we can pump just under 300,000 souls into our flame to max it out. While we're down here, we can also submit our 30 humanity to the Daughter of Chaos in order to claim Chaos Firestorm, the main spell we'll be using this run. And with that, we're set up for, at least in theory, a majority of the run. All that's left now is to put it all to work. Let's kick it off with the Iron Golem. Power within Red Tearstone Ring, Dust Crown, Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring on a maxed out Pyromancy Flame on a Chaos Storm that can hit with multiple pillars of flame in one button press. This is the Chaos Storm setup, and it easily decimates the Iron Golem. At this point I realized that I was supposed to have two points for the Gargoyles, so I'll add that second point for Intelligence level 17. The next boss on my list is the Danger Doggo. The Chaos Storm takes two attempts to set up, but once it lands it easily clears the damage for a one shot. My man Laurentius has unfortunately lived out his purpose, so he'll be converted into intelligence level 19 before we head down to the Gaping Dragon. Chaos Firestorm setup once again clears without any complications. After freeing Big Hat Logan from Sens, who we'll need a little later, the Firebomb Golem and Ricard both make the mistake of existing within 5 miles of my character. They'll become intelligence levels 21 and 22. At this point it's time to make our move into An Orlando, and a Dragon King Great Axe special attack with Power Within alone is enough to decimate both gargoyles for intelligence 23 and 24. With both gargoyles out of the way, we can easily make our way into the keep and take on the Weight Watchers. This fight is the first one where the setup is actually quite tricky. I want to kill Ornstein first and then follow up with Smo, which on paper is quite easy. Ornstein should separate himself off of his buddy quite easily because of the speed discrepancy, but we need more than just that. We also need Ornstein to stay in place long enough in order to land our one shot, but also while out of Smo's range. Not to mention that in hyper mode we are operating on a tight timer so the setup needs to line up just right, fairly fast in the fight. Eventually though, we get enough alone time with Ornstein to get in a Hyper Mode Dragon King Great Axe special, and moving into Super Smo, we let Power Within retake us back down into Hyper Mode after we heal, and let Chaos Storm do all the work. That's the An Orlando duo down in two button presses.
After burning the Titanite Demon in the Catacombs, as well as the Black Knight into another intelligence point, we move into the Tomb of the Giants. Here we can take of Patches, Vince, Nico, and Paladin Leroy without too many issues. However, we did manage to screw up the one shot on the Black Knight, and before we could reset the Knight, it did throw itself into the Gravity Pit. By Lemon's rules, this means the point is null and void, so we won't mark anything down for this one. Gravelord Nito is going to be pretty easy to one shot in a vacuum. It's more of a challenge to be hit by the boss than it is to avoid him, but the skeletons are a slightly different story. No matter how weak they are, we're still going to be in hyper mode, so it's going to be easy for them to kill us and they can still easily interrupt our spell casts. Either way, it's just a little fancy footwork and some good luck to find the right angle. Nito goes down. Straight Demon is the next one on my list, and it's not like I needed the Titanite's lab, but sitting on me mid one shot is still kinda rude. Now that we've hit our intelligence goal of 32, it's time to start investing into decks for the upgrade to spellcasting speed. Starting with the Black Knight by the Painted Doll, and then working our way through Armored Tusk number 1, Pig number 2, the Crystal General before Seath, and the Mimic carrying the Enchanted Falchion. Seath the Scaleless is up next and he's about as easy as I could ask for. Stand next to his crystal as we take into hyper mode, and when he goes to attack, go in and cast. His attack breaks his own crystal, stunning him and making our window to one-shot him massive. Hyper Mode Chaos Storm does its job once again. Since a lot of the Izalith bosses are immune to fire, we need to finish making our intelligence build, and for that, we're going to need a lot of souls. So let's start heading into the DLC land. Sanctuary Guardian isn't too bad. Just wait for either a wing sweep or the flying attack and follow up with a hyper mode chaos storm. Easy enough. Next up on my list is the Mimic who drops the very good carving, who I aptly named the very good Mimic. That leads us to... hold on just a second. Where's Artorius? Oh my god, did I one shot Artorius but never spent that point? Alright, back up the footage. Let's see how we put him down. So Artorius initially seemed a bit tricky to set up. His windows of opportunity seem like they're going to be quite small to work with, so it's not going to be easy to find a full-on casting window. But then I found something fairly hilarious. Turns out, when you're crouched down for a firestorm attack, Artorius has a number of sword attacks that will just miss the player. So by just running in and casting a Chaos Storm in Hyper Mode, we avoid a dashing attack and take out Artorius in one button press. Alright, back to the present. After eliminating the Crest Key Mimic for Dex Point 21 and picking up Dark Bead, I still don't have enough points to fill out my Intelligence build. So we'll farm the Phalanxes and Painted World for a while to get the souls I need and take down Jeremiah while I'm here. Once we have the souls, we can head back to Big Hat Logan. And after buying out his stock, he'll move up to Seath's room where we... I didn't count the Logan point either! With the Tin Crystallization Catalyst in hand, we finally have the juice we need to rip through the Lost Izalith Gauntlet. The same exact magic buffs that work for Pyromancy work for our sorcery setup, so we'll run through that for the next few bosses. Ceaseless Discharge is first up, and there was only one way this was going to end. Kirk makes his second appearance in the Demon Runes and becomes another point in our dexterity before we move on to the Demon Fire Sage. Fun fact, the base of his staff doesn't deal any damage when it hits you. We do with that information what you'd think we would. Centipede Demon slowly walks up to us so we can gift him a very dark bead before we move into the Lost Izalith. Here we can eliminate the Chaos Sister and the final Kirk encounter before we take on the Bed of Chaos. Almost anything will work on the Bed of Chaos, but there is a very specific method of one-shotting the tree that would be more satisfying than any other. I will never not hate this armor. Gwendolyn is next up on my list, so after turning in Orlando Dark, we can grab a dex point off of each Dark Moon Blade, a third one off of the Firebomb Goddess, and while we're at it, we can eliminate the Crystal Halberd Mimic. 
Gwendolyn time. And as exciting as running up to the boss and pressing a button is, there's something else I want to draw attention to. So one of my attempts, I grabbed my bloodstain to reclaim my souls, and then my power within ran out just before I cast a dark beat on Gwendolyn. This caused the attempt to fail, so I quit out and reset the fight. I then re-enter the fight the next attempt and kill Gwendolyn. I turn around after finishing the cutscene, souls still in hand, and then by instinct pick up the bloodstain. To which I ask, where the hell did this bloodstain come from? It's not mine, I haven't died since picking up my stain from the failed fight. If anybody knows what's going on here, feel free to let me know in the comments. We have one more boss before we can move into the Titans of One-Shot Challenges, but before that we take out the Pyromancy Teacher for Dex 35 and the Fire Tempest spell, a more powerful version of the Chaos Storm, just without the Fire Pools. Calamy is the last boss on our list before we begin to move into nearly impossible territory. Calamite has very few opportunities for us to unleash a full Fire Tempest on him, so we need the perfect moment. Even then, we're still a bit reliant on RNG to make the Flame Pillars appear in the right location. The right combination we're looking for is Sweeping Breath Attack on the ground, followed by a melee combo that will hopefully miss us. This particular combo isn't too hard to find though, since Calamite is pretty fond of breathing fire when you're far away from him, and also likes to melee when you're up close. It takes a few tries, but in almost no time at all, we find the one button Calamite kill. And with Calamite out of the way, we can blast through Chester's invasion and move on to the place where one shot runs go to die. The next two bosses could easily kill the run. If we want to make this run all bosses, then we have to make it through Manus. A tanky behemoth that no damage source, regardless of the applied buffs, can kill by itself. A fully loaded Fire Tempest by itself cannot output enough damage to one-shot Manus. This boss is possible, but more on that later, because we have an even bigger problem. As of Lemon giving us this challenge, there has been nobody in history that we could find that killed the four kings in one button press. Is it possible to kill each individual king in one hit? Absolutely. But the four kings in one button press before we took this challenge on had never been done. If we don't make it past the four kings, there just won't be a complete run, let alone an all bosses run. If we want to consider this run a victory, actually completing the game under low level one shot rules, then we need to find a way to pass the four kings. Since we began this challenge, I basically spent no time planning for the actual route and invested all of my energy theory crafting how I would defeat the four kings. Between looking into the most damage I could output with one button press and going over the rules time and time again, I piled over ideas on how to make this work. And after some time, I think I figured it out. Keep in mind that the rules state that everything must be done in one button press. For the theme of this challenge, a continuous attack is still one attack. So this brought my attention to a spell that many people often overlooked. Fire Surge. This spell lets you unleash a continuous stream of fire like a flamethrower by holding down the attack button. This means we can have an extremely elongated attack with one button press. While we're in the Abyss, one of our ring slots must be committed to the Covenant of Artorias so we can even enter the boss fight. But even with just Red Tearstone Ring and Power Within, we can output a massive amount of damage. There's easily enough damage to kill an entire king, and while it dies we have more than enough damage to burn through almost half of the entire four kings health bar on just one king. And we even have more Fire Surge left over. This is excellent news. With the damage we're outputting, we theoretically have enough fire surge to eliminate the four kings in one button press. Here's the problem. We have to get the rest of the damage onto another king without releasing the button. At first, I thought we could just pivot onto the next king and let the damage finish the fight. 
but the problem is we can't get close enough to the second king so our damage can land. That's when my brain had the epiphany. What if I was already close enough to the second king when it spawned? I never really thought about it before, but there's a very real possibility that the kings have a fixed spawn point in the room. And as it turns out, the spawn point of the second king is indeed a fixed point. It took a little bit of feeling out and rough triangulation with bloodstains, but eventually I found the place where the second king spawned. And thus, we had the perfect setup. Using a previous bloodstain, we mark the place the second king will spawn. We then lure the first king to the spawn point of the second king and hold him there. It's roughly 45 seconds between each king's spawn, so now it becomes a balancing act. We need to make it so that around the 42 second mark we are landing in hyper mode by balancing the king's attacks and power within. If timed correctly, just seconds before the second king spawns, we burn down the first king. Continuing the fire search through the first king, we wait until the second king is targetable, and then switch our already pulsing fire surge into the second king, and finish the fight. And that, as far as I know upon killing them, is the world's first one button for kings. Or was it? After all, I'm not the only one taking on this challenge. This is a run that several highly skilled and knowledgeable players agreed to take on together. Lemon selected some brilliant Souls players, so it's entirely possible that someone figured out the same thing. This is a competition after all, so it's entirely possible that somebody had already done it before me without knowing. We all made our own strats, our own routes, and our own runs. So was I the world's first? Well. For that knowledge, Lemon either is going to, or has already put out his own video covering everybody's runs. Whether or not I was the only one who figured it out, the first one to figure it out, or the last one to figure it out, you'll have to check out his video on the results of the entire group challenge to find out. But regardless of other runners' results, I figured out something that hasn't been, to my knowledge, recorded in Dark Souls history. I've achieved many things in this game, but this one? This one feels pretty amazing. And then Manus reminded me what game I was playing. Manus, the father of the abyss. While he's been done before, I cannot understate how incredibly difficult it is to find the one shot on this creature. Like I alluded to before, Fire Tempest by itself cannot kill the behemoth by itself but it is still possible. In order to slay Manus, Fire Tempest not only needs to go off, but it needs to go off under very specific conditions. Let's count off all of the things that need to happen at the same time in order for the Manus one-shot to occur. Number 1. The player must be in a fully stacked hyper mode. This means Power Within taking the player's life down, Red Tearstone Ring, Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring, Dust Crown, and a fully upgraded Ascended Pyromancer Flame. Number 2. Fire Tempest must connect with the maximum ticks of damage. Keep in mind, this doesn't just mean that three pillars tag Manus. You see, in order to make Firestorm spells not broken, there's a small interval of time after being hit by a pillar that you become invincible from the spell's damage. That way, nothing in the game can just be shredded by 17 instances of massive damage. We'll call this small interval of time the hit cooldown. In order for all three ticks of damage to occur, Three different pillars all have to land on Manus, evenly spaced out by the hit cooldown. And finally, number 3. At least one of the hits must occur during a dodge. If one of the hits connects during a dodge, its pillar's damage will increase by 50%, theoretically giving enough damage to kill Manus. Only when all three of these conditions are met, the boss will go down in one button press. And would you like to know what determines these three conditions? Luck. I really wish there was more to it, but it genuinely is an RNG check. Only those who are lucky enough can one-shot Manus. There's no RNG manipulation to make you fulfill the conditions, there's no clever way to alter the build, no super technical movement. It's just... luck.
The only thing that can really help with this is to increase your dexterity enough to hit the spell casting speed cap, which I most certainly did. Spending some time to gather more points, I raised myself to the cap. Anything and everything I could do to make this potentially easier, I did. And the end result? 311 failed attempts. Three minutes shy of exactly 10 entire hours. By a landslide, the most attempts I've ever committed to a challenge, and it still didn't happen. No matter how many attempts I threw at Manus, it didn't happen. At which point I asked myself, Will I even be happy when I beat this? Any jokes aside, I began to realize that I had taken on a low level one shot challenge and as a result of that I'd entered the lottery. A lottery that wasn't dependent on execution and at that point I realized that it had no longer become a challenge. There's no skill in winning a lottery just waiting for it to happen. There would be no sense of achievement and above all else, I wasn't really enjoying it. At the end of the day, if I don't feel a sense of fulfillment or enjoyment for the attempts I'm making anymore, then why bother? So I decided that was the end of attempting Manus. I don't want to take away from anybody who has or does manage to one-shot Manus. It's a big achievement to do. But it's just not the kind of achievement I'm personally interested in chasing anymore. And with that, there was only one more mark on my list. We made our way to Gwyn. And with a parry and a hyper mode fire surge, we eliminate the Lord of Cinder. And with that, we have officially completed the Dark Souls Remastered Low Level One Shot Challenge. I am super glad that I got to take on this challenge. Like I said earlier, I've wanted to take on the low level one shot for years now. And the thrill of not only getting to complete one, but being either the first or one of the first people to actually fully complete one feels amazing. Sure, Manus may have walled us out of a true all bosses run, but honestly, I don't feel bad about leaving it behind. Challenge runs in my opinion exist to explore the different ways to push the game. They make you discover new strategies, explore parts of the games you may not have thought to, and to make you grow as a player. I don't think there's anything more as a player I can gain from attempting to one-shot Manus, so I have no regrets leaving it behind. Fun fact, if you took away all of the Manus attempts, then this run would have taken less than 16 hours to complete. Not that speed earns any bonus points, but just a fun little statistic that feels pretty cool. Once again, I'd like to thank Lemon for inviting me to be a part of this group project. Not only taking on the run, but the opportunity to meet with and collaborate with so many different challenge runners has been an absolute blast. To all my fellow runners, I can't wait to work with you all again soon, and I congratulate you all for the amazing work you've put into this project. If you guys would like to see the final result of the low level one shot competition, please check out Lemon's video on the backlogs. And if you want even more low level one shot, I'll have some of my fellow creators linked in the description below. But as far as this challenge goes, that's going to be it for me. If you'd like to see a challenge, feel free to leave me a suggestion either in the comments or in the suggestions channel of my discord. I'm getting ready to blast through a bunch of your suggestions, so feel free to drop your ideas so I can add them to my ever growing list. But that's going to do it for me today. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up, pop that subscribe button, and ring ting ling that little bell to be notified whenever I drop another video. You can also join the Discord, link is in the description below to come chat with me and hang out with the rest of the community. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you gamers on the flip side. Later! Okay, real talk. I screamed that Logan line at four in the morning. I probably woke someone up. The sacrifices I make for you. I hope you're happy. <laughs> also, Dad, I'm sorry for waking you up.